Welcome, welcome to Level of Crazy, the podcast where we learn how to optimize our emotional intelligence, grow those EQ muscles, and therefore spending more time in proactive crazy rather than reactive crazy, healing the divide within ourselves and with each other. And today, our guest on Zoom is Ted Brownstein, co-founder of Lake Worth Interfaith Network, faculty at Wilment Institute for Interfaith Dialogue, resident scholar at Temple Adath Or, and Jewish and Christian Baha'i interfaith leader. And today's show is called, With So Many Religions All Preaching Peace, Why Can't We Just Get Along? All right, so today is going to be quite the journey, right, Ted? Uh, yes, it's a really good question. And if we come up with an answer together, that would be crazy. <laughs> absolutely. That would be the good crazy, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. I do like, uh, thank you for having me on your podcast today. I look forward to our conversation together. And I do like uh, the way that the whole thing is framed. As far as, you know, we're all a little bit crazy. It's nice to have fun and embrace it. Yes. And, and thinking outside the box instead of being, you know, really locked in to the ways other people think, you know, when we do something differently than people are used to, they right, right away say that's crazy. And that kind of alludes to a little mental imbalance or something like that. But we'll take it. We're having so much fun anyway, you know, lay it on us, you know, it's okay. Exactly. And, you know, as I went on my journey, I realize that there's two kinds of crazy and it's not, you know, it, it's been spinned. The word crazy has been spinned in such a negative light that for a long time, when I would say level of crazy, you know, people were like, how dare you? They were just so insulted with what I was saying. And I was like, no, that's not what I'm saying. You know, I'm, I'm not talking about clinically crazy, you know, or people that really do belong in a mental institution. I'm talking about crazy, like everyday crazy, like everyday issues, you know, like you and me, Ted, you know, like we live in the world, we have jobs, we have businesses, we have responsibilities, we have bills and all these different things, you know, keep us running. And sometimes you do feel like a hamster in a wheel, right? <laughs> exactly. And so with that, there's that crazy. And then there's another crazy, which is the crazy where you're just good crazy, right? Where you're super creative, super imaginative, super excited, super funny, you know, super, um, you know, uh, good at something. So you're like crazy about it, right? And so I want people to really reframe this word crazy and it's happening in the past couple of years i've been seeing that it's really happening so i'm really inspired by that so i'm excited oh well, that's fun that's a lot of fun yeah so um so we recently uh you know we've been friends a long time um i would say we met uh probably when i started going to tao which probably was about 13 years ago and um, recently we went to an event, right? It was called Embracing Peace, right? For a sustainable world. Right. Yeah, it was a day long event a couple of weeks ago. And it was such a great event. And we did a little video and that video will be in the show notes so people can watch. But it was such a lovely event. You and David Hall, uh, which he'll be on my show as well. You guys hosted uh, or I guess you planned it or organized it, you know, whatever it was, but you guys did an amazing job. So thank you for keep doing that, you know, keep on looking to create peace in the world. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's actually a, the Lake Worth Interfaith Network has a board active about six members who really co collaborated on creating that day. And um, the, uh, the day started out with a Qigong leader I don't know if you had an opportunity to meet uh, George Love before, but yes, I know him. He has um, just a fun way of leading people through these exercises that are, you know, good for your health, good for relaxation. It's a moving meditation and qigong or like tai chi, and 
and uh, he just makes everybody laugh. He's an African American yes. guy that kind of gets his his um, his uh, beat with it, you know. And he goes, "Get the chi gun, get the chi gun," and he goes, "Heart, heart, spleen, spleen, kidney, kidney," you know. Yes, exactly. And, people, and then he goes faster and faster, you know. And everybody's cracking up and and having a good time and really getting loose and uh, getting into kind of a meditative state. And the thinking behind that, then we had some serious sessions, you know, we had a panel discussion with Rabbi Mark Labowitz from TAO, uh, Sheikh Ghassan, a, a, a Islamic leader who does a lot of peace work in the Holy Land, Donna Kerner, who has worked with the UN and gone to trouble spots all around the world. We had a Baha'i speaker, a Buddhist speaker, and a Christian moderator and so forth. So it was an interfaith panel. Serious topic though, how do we bring about world peace? So what's the link then between the, the fun meditation and the larger, you know, serious issues of world peace? Well, really, it's hard to have world peace when people are um, disrupted inside, when people are agitated inside, people are unfulfilled inside. And those inward disturbances, conflicts, pain, trauma, whatever it is, then reflects in the way we treat other people, from family to neighborhood to larger community to our views of the world, are really a reflection of what's going on in our head at any given time. And the level of balance, the level of uh, inner peace and tranquility that we've been able to obtain through you know, whatever work we do on ourselves psychologically to to grow spiritually emotionally mentally and so forth so those two things are linked and i think that's and the thing that's interesting you know we had a whole range of activities on that one day but we also had toward the end of the day a drumming circle and a great leader who's good with beginners and everything but we were a little bit concerned with whether the people that were there for the serious part of the day would get into the drumming or whether we'd start to lose people who'd say, okay, you know, I've had enough, it's been a long day, I want to take off. We had such a good time with the drumming. Everybody who was there, some, you know, elderly folks would get on their walker and go over to their seat, and then they'd be banging on that drum, you know, <laughs> and having just a great time, and was really pleased. And I think kind of people got into the space, you know, they were not guarded they were relaxed they were comfortable with each other through the course of the day you know we had lunch on the floor and we had a great meal with the offered by the Sikh community in south florida and so forth so the day really set people at ease they got to make new friends reconnect with old friends and and i think it was effective in growing the inner peace which hopefully will reflect into the world as an expression of outer peace yeah, well, everything you're describing is EQ, right? That's exactly what we're saying here. So, you know, the more we can work on these EQ muscles, the more we can optimize emotional intelligence and in ourselves, that's when we can have these commonalities. That's where we can grow. That's where we can be okay within ourselves so that we can bring that on the outer, you know, um, and heal that divide, you know, within ourselves and with each other. And it's so amazing what you're saying about the inner, it, when they're not feeling well, when they need to, you know, do exercises. And yes, Dr. Love, I've known him for many years, and actually he's going to be on the show as well. Um, you know, that is vital. And I will definitely be doing a, a show about health and wellness. And that is actually a big topic. That is, you know, that's exactly what we talk about in the clinic, you know, with FBC, you know, Florida Balance Centers. Um, so we are very big about movement, nutrition, you know, all that stuff. So I'm a huge component of that. Uh, and I love that you brought that up, you know, because I think people don't realize that when you're not feeling good because you're having a physical condition, you're having a medical condition, it's going to translate into you not feeling good, which is going to translate into you not being a happy person, which translates into you being grumpy. And then you turn into maybe a nasty person to the person in front of you at the store or your job or your partner and so on. 
right? And so it's a big domino effect. So yeah, all of these things play such an important role. So thank you for mentioning that and reminding me about Dr. Love because actually <laughs> I had to get back to him. So let's um let's talk about your book here. You have two books. Um, you sent me two books or you gave me one a while ago and then you sent me one. So I'm going to give everyone the title and then I'm going to show them for those that will look this up on YouTube. Uh, the Interface Prayer Book, which is this beautiful little blue booklet. It's lovely. And it has um, a lot of different religions in here and little prayers within those religions. And I have some comments about that. And I want to read you a little section that I found in there. And then this other book, which is The Kinship of the Bible and the Quran, an interfaith perspective. And one of the first things I noticed about this book is that it's this very interesting shape. Can you describe the shape of this book? Well, it's long and thin. <laughs> long and thin, okay. It stands out on a bookshelf. But yes. But really the idea behind it, if you wanna open it up and maybe show your audience the inside pages, the way the layout goes on the inside, there are um, captions on the head of most pages. And then the page, content of the pages is short and there are graphics on a lot of the pages. And so the idea was that, you know, as you read a book, you kind of, uh, you know, meander through the pages and then there's a subheading in the middle of, of the next page or the chapter break or whatever. But, you know, we're living in an age that's fast and you kind of want different points to stand out. And so the book is designed so that uh, a particular topic can fit on a page or two. And so having the long page with more space to work with made it easier to do the page layouts to lead to that readability and that sense of impact that you get from a standalone little topic on one page. It's, you know, it's kind of like chicken soup for the soul kind yeah. of format. And so um, that that was really the origin of the of the layout being a, a longer page, not yeah. to have it be wide and big like a coffee table book, but it's readable lines, easy easy to read, and yet um, is uh, impactful. Yes, I agree with you. You know, my book is uh, is going to be a very small book. It's going to be five by seven, and it's also going to be uh, very short and sweet. And uh, just straight to the point um, with little bite-sized chapters about tools. And it's just going to be, I call it the pocket guide, your EQ pocket guide. So it's something that people can carry in their purse or in their pocket and just have it with them at all times. So I'm with you about that short and sweet kind of thing. Nobody has time. You know, the world is speeding up every second. And it's like, nobody has time to sit here and process and figure things out. And even though we, we have to, because we're humans and we need that, but if we can create a quick, short and sweet answer to something, especially emotions, especially how do you deal with your emotional dysfunction in a quick and simple way, right? Like I know for me, that's what I needed. I didn't have time to sit here and do workshops and da, 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 which I've gone to every workshop known to man. <laughs> and I love workshops and I love to conduct workshops, but, <clears throat> but I also know that for me, when I watch some of my mentors, um, like Steve Harvey and Dr. Phil, they just have a way, right? They just have a way of just getting straight to the bottom of it. They don't, you know, excuse my French, pussyfoot around anything. And they just go straight to it. And they just say what they have to say. And you either get it, you don't, you get offended, you don't, but this is what it is. <laughs> so I love that. I love that. It's so my way. And, um, you know, I have to admit that I have gotten softer um, but I think it's become just more refined and clear that that's really how I think people need it. That's how people need this information is short and sweet, you know, for them to process it. Yeah. The so, short and the sweet are equally important, aren't they? Yes. So I, I like the old story about, you know, talking to your, your dog 
and you can be petting your dog and you can say the most awful thing about that dog. But if you say it in a sweet tone of voice, they really don't care. Right. You know, exactly. People do hear the body language, the tone of voice, those things much more than maybe the content, the ideas about what's being said. So being slow and deliberate in answers, especially with a controversial topic or something that might push people's buttons is really effective. Yeah. Slow and down, I'll be honest, breathe, you know, mm -hmm. be kind, smile, all those external things really help with the communication. Yeah. And I'll be honest. I, uh, I had a call today with my family. We've been struggling with some things and I did not do well. I did not do well. I, you know, that's why level of crazy was actually created because I recognize my level of crazy. And so, um, I tried, I, 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 you know, anyone who knows me knows I try, but I definitely lost my cookies at some point in the conversation because it's just, there's some things going on and it just was so frustrating and I just couldn't take it anymore. So I think that, I think that the idea is to ultimately get there. And maybe with this conversation about religions, maybe we're all trying to get there, but we just can't, we just, we're just missing all these different pieces because our EQ is not refined and we just keep refining it. And it's like going to take it's going to take time, right? Practice, learn by doing. Every time we practice, we get better. And it's a muscle. It's like, you know, like going to the gym. So I want to read you, uh, I want to read the audience this part from the Interfaith Prayer Book uh, in the forward. You know, when I first started reading this book, the very first part in this book was so um, right on for me. And uh, maybe the listeners can agree to this or not, whatever. So, um, but I think they can feel into, they, 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 they probably will feel into what you're trying to say here. This small prayer book is dedicated to the unity of all religions. The great faith traditions of mankind hold many of the same spiritual values reference, sorry, uh, reverence for the creator appreciation of nature, respect for sacredness of life, recognition of the need for personal and collective salvation and faith in divine governance over human affairs further in all promote the cultivation of virtues, love, kindness, honesty, humanity, discipline, and service. Despite this foundation of shared beliefs, Religious differences too often cause suspicion and animosity. Commonalities go unnoticed and misunderstandings prevail. The bridge to reconciliation is mutual understanding and respect. The more we know about other faiths, the more we shall all see our commonalities. And, you know, in my book, I have a very funny comparison. And this is what this reminded me of. I always say, if once you get to know your own crazy, then you can recognize it in someone else. And that crazy is what bonds us should bond us together instead of separate us. Right? Right. Yeah. Especially if we can enjoy each other's company, you know, yes. through humor, through joking, through a camaraderie, you know, there's a closeness to other people that comes about through laughing together. Yes. You know, it's yes. a really bonding uh, element. It's a real bonding tool. And so, uh, you know, the more that we can laugh at ourselves and situations and kind of, you know, uh, breathe into them and not let them ruffle our feathers, you know, it makes us happier, makes us nicer to be around, makes people around us catch that same energy. You know, yes, 100%. And even, you know, even with the level of crazy, that's reactive crazy, right? Like sometimes like we have situations where maybe a person is really struggling and they're super reactive. They just don't see their own blind spots, right? And if we are able, because today I wasn't able, but normally, like, let's just say you're not fully plugged into a situation and you have the bandwidth to do it. 
if you can remind yourself that every person is a sentient being, right? Every person is doing their best. Every person is just, you know, this could be the best they can do in that moment. And, um, you know, if we could, right, if we could, it would be a magical world, wouldn't it? Yeah. It's interesting <laughs> that you use the word sentient. Because, Say again? You know, it's the word sentient. It's a part of a very uh, common prayer in Buddhism. <laughs> yes. Right. It's uh, may all sentient beings be free from suffering. Exactly. May all sentient beings be happy. Yes. And by that sentient being, they mean more than people. They also mean, you know, the animals and so forth. Every being that, you know, can, is aware of its around, surroundings, has senses to take in the exterior world is a sentient being, a thinking, feeling, experiencing being at some level. Yes, exactly. So that, broad, that broad perspective in Buddhism really is insightful too. Yeah. Well, that's exactly where I got it from is Buddhism. I've been studying a lot of Buddhism over the years. And whenever I go, it always reminds me of that. Um, you know, one of the things, and, and I want to ask you um, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to define to us what is interfaith. But before I do that, you know, one of the things I noticed in this little book as I continue to read is that all these prayers even though they all had their own way of describing the prayer, you know, like some of them would talk about God. Some of them would talk about nature. Some of them talked about um, dance and movement. But at the end of the day, what I noticed was it's like every single religion was calling out to this creator and was begging the creator to come and support them, come and be with them, come and create peace and love and harmony, give them whatever it is that they need, you know, like bless me with a child or bless me with money or health or whatever. Right. Um, and so here we are going back to the title of the show, which is so many amazing religions, all preaching peace, all preaching asking this creator to come down and serve us and, and help us and whatever. And we just can't get along. So that's a big question. And before we get into that, I want you to help us understand what is inner faith. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I think there is some confusion. And so that's why it, you know, needs some clarification. Uh, inner faith dialogue, as it was originally conceived, is about different people of different faith backgrounds sitting around the table, having honest and open conversations, being able to ask the questions that maybe you're afraid to ask and finding out how other people view things and, and having listening ears to learn. And it's very specifically designed not to try to convert people one to the other religion or to be an opportunity to preach it's an opportunity to learn about the other. You know, what would this world be, Esther, if there were no mirrors? We get so used to images of ourselves. Now it's, we have pictures, we have video, or I'm staring at myself during this conversation, you know. But many people throughout history, especially like pioneers in the American West, the only time they saw an image of themselves if they came to a clear pool of water and they could look at their reflection in the water. They didn't have it in their bathroom to, you know, comb their hair by or brush their teeth or, you know, make themselves look better. And so when uh, we can get a, a good look at ourselves, understand ourselves better. Well, sometimes the best mirror is a different point of view. Somebody says something that we never thought of before, and we can use that to reflect upon what makes our perspective different than their perspective. We really get a deeper understanding of ourselves through knowing the other. And so this is one of the great benefits of having these, you know, frank, open conversations. Now, people do see 
a lot of the commonalities in different faith traditions. And some people have taken interfaith to a different direction and created a fusion system of worship, like another, like an interfaith church. And so they will go to their particular church on a given time, of, maybe it's on a Sunday evening or some other time, and there will be a liturgy like there would at a Jewish or a Christian service where they'll read certain prayers and they'll, you know, they'll uh, have certain, have a sermon and other different things. But their, their service is intentionally designed to pull a little bit from this faith and pull a little bit from that faith and pull a little bit from that faith. So they're making a new faith as a fusion and composite of all the faiths of the world. And this too can be a beautiful thing and a lot of people are drawn to it because, you know, I was at an interfaith service and they'll, they'll chant Adon Alam to a, uh, to a Hindu chant, you know, uh, rhythm and so forth and so on. And you can do that, you know, mixing parts of different uh, faiths and create another thing of beauty with it. But that's, and some people then are afraid of their religion being lost their faith tradition and what what they like about their religion being lost in that fusion and that amalgamation. And so they some people become afraid of interfaith because of that aspect. But that's really an outgrowth and a later understanding. Interfaith as it's conceived is each one keeps their own and you just come to understand each other and understand yourself better through your contact, you know, with the other. That's why some groups now are using the term multi-faith instead of interfaith to, to, to make it clear that you're not melting everything into one. You're all keeping your own perspectives in this collective. See, now, let me tell you that that when you said um, you're not coming to convince anyone, you're just coming to learn and share and be your best version of you. And that is, I think, where the problem is. And I think that is where we're gonna get closer to the answer of so many religions and why can't we just get along? And I think that is why, because, and, and that is why in so many other areas of our life as well, right? Whether it's family, whether it's a partner, uh, work, whatever, but as humans, I think that is exactly the problem right there is that everybody's always trying to convince every the other person of I'm right. No, my way is the right way. No, mine. No, mine. And you have constantly this power struggle and it doesn't get us anywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, to make the situation um, a little bit tougher to deal with is the fact that within each religious tradition, there are schisms, divisions, and denominations. And they all have somewhat different take on how the religion, how the tradition should be expressed in the modern world. Some want to stick to the original and get as close as they can. Some want to adapt to modernity and, and realize that we live in a different world than maybe our scripture or our traditions emerged. And so they want to you know, change in view of those things. And so I um, mean, you have this classic battle between the traditionalists, you know, and the progressives or the conservatives and the liberals and religion has split between so many of these things. One of, uh, you know, my favorite jokes, which you and your listeners have probably heard this uh, Jewish guy is stranded on a desert island. He's shipwrecked and he's there for a long time and he builds two synagogues. And then when he's rescued, people say, well, you're alone here on this island. Why did you build two synagogues? He says, well, this is the one I pray at on every Shabbat, you know? Okay, so why the other one? That's the synagogue I never go near. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, so, you know, you have these things, you know, we're saying, well, you have to grow your beard or, you have to eat only kosher, or you can or can't do this on Shabbos, or you have to light the candles from the right to the left instead of from the left to the right, or, you know, whatever the tradition is, oh, you have to have the bread before the wine. No, you have to have the wine before the bread. 
you know, yes. and all these things, you know, uh, that groups have split over these hairs. They really have, you know. And so this sense of being right extends just beyond individual religions, but into denominationalism, into sectarianism. Yeah. And, and so, you know, it's so fascinating, you know, what you're describing, because it's true. Like, why can't we just um, do what's right for us? Like when I was, when I was a kosher person, um, I was uh, studying with an organization where I became um, orthodox, you know, and I did the whole thing. I ate kosher. I wore wigs. I did mikvah. I did the whole thing. You wore wigs, and huh? at the time, yeah. yeah, right. You would have never known that. Yeah. And at the time, it was exactly what I needed. It was what I needed for my own discipline, my own growth as an individual. And I, there was no need to convince me to do it. I, I knew I wanted to do it. And so I was able to just be myself, do what I had to do. And, um, and it was a, it was a great experience, but when it was time to move on, I moved on and here I am now, you know, wearing a beautiful EQ cape with emotions underneath it, you know? <laughs> oh, that's so, what that is, different smiley faces or whatever. With yes. The, these are our emotions, emotions. right? That's so great. for the listeners, you, if you watch the YouTube, you'll know that I have little emojis under my cape describing all the different emotions we have. And so that's EQ to the rescue. And, um, you know, and so, you know, EQ has become my superpower, but before EQ was my superpower, that was what I needed as a, as a human being to grow my EQ, not knowing that that's what I was trying to do at the time. So, um, so, you know, this is a fascinating, it's a fascinating thing. And I think that we need to get more, you know, if we can just start with grassroots, you know, really teaching people to uh, be more like that interfaith um, perspective. And and I want to and I want to read from this other book, which is the kinship of the Bible and Quran, uh, which is your book. Uh, it says here, the aim is not to eliminate diversity, but to facilitate mutual understanding and friendship. And so again, it's what you're describing when you come together to have these dialogues and to have these conversations. And it could be a conversation about football, or it could be a conversation about whatever. You know, why do we need to convince each other, right? Why do we need, oh, no, he did it like this, or he did it like that. He should have done this, or he should have done that. Why does it need to be that way? Just let it go. It's not that serious. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Um, so so let's continue um, this dialogue. But I do want to give everyone kind of a visual of a solution for that, if anybody is interested. So here's a solution, and I talked about this before, is that Tom and I, when we were just moving into the condo, uh, we, we are both very strong-willed, and he has his opinions. I have mine, obviously, just like every couple. And obviously, you know, there's differences with, you know, male brains and women's brains. And there is scientific proof about that. So if anybody's out there going, no, that's not true. Yes, it is. <laughs> there is scientific proof that there are differences between men and women. Um, so he wanted to decorate a certain way. So did I. And let me tell you, we had some serious fights over that. And we almost broke up over decorating the house and that seems trivial but this was just a macro of the what is it the micro of the macro you know what i mean um into the depth of our relationship and the ability to work together through bigger problems that we couldn't even figure out how to decorate the freaking house <laughs> so eventually we figured it out and what we figured out was you like this. I like this. If we don't both like it, it's not coming into the house. Mm. And you know what we figured out mm. was that when we combined both of our tastes, meaning 
when he saw something and I saw something and we both liked it, it was probably the best version of that thing mm. because it was that moment, right? Of pure right. synchronicity. And so we were able to make it amazing. And that's the same thing that we do now with almost everything, whether we are running the business, whether we're decorating or throwing a party or whatever. Um, it's really about honoring each other's strengths and supporting, you know, when you have a weakness, right now, right. we're not always perfect at this. We're still humans, but yeah. it's definitely, it's definitely works better than how it was before where you had the power struggles and that was getting us nowhere. Cool. Well, here's something that's worked for us and we're kind of branching off into marital relations, but really we're talking about conflict resolution. Exactly. Which, you know, covers the religious conflicts and national conflicts and everything else. Thank you for uh, helping uh, we, us understand that. For us is uh, what I like to call the three bucket system. Your bucket, my bucket, our bucket. And so we have places in the house where it's each of our place, like my study. First of all, it's all dark wood. My wife likes everything to be bright and yellow. <laughs> I like the, you know, the dark wood. Uh, her places are neat as a pen. They're ready for a good housekeeping magazine to come in at any unannounced moment and take a picture. Every, every, everything is always put away. Me, my desk is full of piles. This project is in this pile. It's organized. I kind of have a one layer system. I don't like stuff piled on top of each other where it gets lost. But I have things organized and sometimes I jump from one project to the other. And so my stuff is there ready to go. And I have a couple hours to work on that, whatever it is. So I have my bucket. And she has her spaces, particularly the kitchen, but most of the house really except for my spaces, but that's fine. You know, but then we have our spaces that are in common where we kind of do what you do with uh, with Tom and, you know, we make collective decisions on, you know, how we want to do it. And we both have to like it for it to be in that space. But I think it's important for people, each everybody to have their own private space and have their own private expressions of their personality. And they can just, you know, be comfortable in that context and then also share you know, in another context, in a common context. Exactly. Exactly. So, <clears throat> so let's take one concept here and, and use the rest of the time here to break that down. I know that we have a bit of a time crunch here. So I would say what has helped you to recognize and manage your level of crazy being in the work that you are now in with this inner faith and everything that you're doing, give us a little bit of a breakdown so that the listeners can walk away with a tool that can help them. Well, you know, I think part of what I have learned over a period of time in working with organizations, with working with other people, with working with a board, whether it's a corporate or not-for-profit or what the situation is, is that people grow when they're empowered and people take on things and have creative uh, ideas and creative energies and that we're stronger together with everybody's input in the mix <laughs> even if some of the things the choices that are made aren't my preference and so um, you know i'll tell you a little bit of the history of the interfaith board uh, we've been around for 20 years. There were uh, five of us initially, and then seven or eight, uh, you know, directing things in the beginning. And we had a certain protocol of, you know, what we did. We had three events a year. We did Thanksgiving Day Service of Gratitude. We did Martin Luther King Day Prayer Breakfast. We had a, a National Day of Prayer uh, common event. And that's what we did, three events, do, 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 do. Little by little, somebody moved away. Somebody got a time... Uh, job as a full-time pastor and wasn't involved with us anymore, you know, and then there was, were, uh, was another group of people that came in. And for a long time, um, uh, the board wasn't really doing anything. And I was the last person that was, you know, the founding member and I was like doing everything, you know. 
So then, uh, you know, the time changed and other people came along and we got a nice diverse board of good people, but they were kind of inexperienced at interfaith work. You know, each one had their own faith connections and their own history. And so there was a secretary whose name was on the corporate filing, but never did any minutes, never did anything. I was doing all the secretary work, you know, the accounting work, the, you know, the reporting to the state and get the 501c3 registered and all that stuff. But, you know, okay, let people function at the level that they are. And then you give them an opportunity. Well, how about if you organize this program? I, I'm going away for the summer. I can't do it. Whatever's going on in my own life. So somebody took it over. And then every week, this person began to schedule somebody for our interfaith meditation on Wednesday night. Get a little plug in there, 6.30 on Zoom. We have a different interfaith leader every week. And it's really interesting to see the different meditation styles and so forth. Public can join, no no membership or fee required. But this person really took charge and then she started finding new people and bringing them in for meditation. And, and she's a great teacher in her own right, you know. So um, that worked out. On this uh, Embracing Peace Day, uh, there were things that were done that were outside the box for us. We had never charged for any event in the past, never had a registration fee. And we even bragged about it a little bit. All these other places charge for all these things. You know, uh, we're just welcoming and, you know, we find uh, sponsors and get things done without the funding. And we don't want to, you know, we don't want to charge for things. You'll never be charged. And all of a sudden, there was a, some voices on the board that wanted to do a whole day event. A little bit like the Parliament of World Religions, which we had all gone to in Chicago to copy that model for a conference. And they wanted to have a, a, you know, a fee so that we could cover some more expenses, do some more interesting things, bring some speakers in maybe to pay them and those type of things that we couldn't do if we didn't have a budget. And I'm like, no, we promised people we would never pay, you know, they didn't have to pay, you know, but turn it over, turn it over, turn it over, turn it over. And, you know, it worked out really well. So That's I think, great. you know, letting go and appreciating people's skills and let them grow into their job and collaborate. And, um, you know, is has been a key to, you know, what we've been able to do here locally. And so that's, would you say that that's how you are able to manage your crazy to learn to let go and to just yeah. kind of oh, trust yeah. the process? Yeah. 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 In the long run, a lot of things really don't matter, you know. They, yeah matter we're just used to doing it a certain way and we we're drawn to our habitual ways and you know in the long run you're going to remember the spirit of the day how many people came how what the what the outcome was as far as you know people you know uh, drawing together building community and you know being uh, deepened in the ways of peace and so um you know that gets accomplished in you know, whether the mat was over here or over there, or whether we have this session before the other, or whether it's inside or outside, it's going to be 90 degrees. You can't do it outside. Well, we were outside. It wasn't so bad, you know. <laughs> exactly. We did the and we did the peace pole planting and did some dances of universal peace around it. And, you know, it was a little warm, but people didn't stay away. It was fine. You know? Yep. See, I think that's great what you're saying. I think that could be the EQ tool of the night is that just let go, trust, let people have their creative um, contribution, let them contribute, even though you may not necessarily agree or, or think it's appropriate or whatever, like as long as, and I heard, you know, Rob, um, uh, Tony Robbins say this one time, which is, there's two kinds of people. There's the people that are all about the details. And then there's all, and then there's the people that are all about the big picture. And what happens is that sometimes we get caught up in the details and we forget about the big picture and, you know, the big picture, meaning that as long as the goal is still accomplished, then the details, sure. Details matter. God is in the details. Yes, of course, right? You have to collect the money. You have to, you know, uh, whatever, register the right Somebody name. Somebody has to have yes. the key to the front door, right? Somebody exactly. The key, the you know, the details do matter. But in the, in the greater scheme of things, like you're describing, certain details 
it's okay. You know, like exactly what you said. If this speaker goes before on this one, it's okay. Or, you know, if the mat was here, it's okay. Because at the end of the day, everybody enjoyed and that's what matters. So I think, you know, in, in the fact that we are, we're going to close now and, and I really appreciate your time, Ted. Um, uh, I want to leave. more minutes, Esther? Say again? You have a few more minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, because I, I would like to take a couple minutes now at the end to address the, uh, the question more directly. That yeah. At the outset, you know, why isn't there world peace with all the religions, you know, espousing peace? Yeah, go for it. And so, you know, we've, we've mentioned a lot of them here. Uh, I think the first thing, uh, if you had a room full of people and you were going to do a workshop in this, you would like to lay the groundwork of showing, yes, all the religions really do teach peace. And you would find texts or prayers or, you know, writings from the different faith traditions to show them all espousing peace. Because people know that vaguely, but you know, if you really see it and there's poetry and there's imagery and it catches, you know, the lamb lying down with the lion and, you know, the imagery and each one will sit under his own vine and fig tree and no one will make him tremble, you know, love your enemy or, you know, whatever the particular is to have those things vividly in mind when you're sitting around the table. Okay. Then what things get in the way? Well, I think part of it we talked about at the outset was people's angst and in, uh, in inner turmoil. And so they really don't know how to do peace. You know, it's just a natural thing to go into conflict. And maybe there's an adrenaline rush, maybe there's a little excitement, and people are drawn to the fight, you know, the excitement of the fight, and they go for the entertainment value in the contest. And can I say something that'll zap this person or... You know, this person said something and I've got to equalize it. I've got to get them back or whatever. So you get some ego and some, you know, uh, joy of the, the contest and lack of peace. That's one of the things that's going on. In addition to people not knowing how to do peace. Mm -hmm. But I think on an international stage and in a philosophical sense, one of the drawbacks is that almost every faith tradition has an exception and to justify war, to have the concept of a just war under this, that, and the other circumstance. But you know, if you're upset and you're angry with the other one, you will make this situation fit that exception <laughs> every time. <laughs> and so the exception ends up taking over everything. And so, you know, it's really a slippery slope to talk about a just war especially in the modern world. This is my viewpoint on this. You know, in the olden days, armies went out to fight and they had bayonets or they had swords and they were fighting the army. And there was only soldiers and combatants that they were, you know, fighting. And if they killed somebody, they were a person that was out there more or less choicefully. Modern war, not like that. We're lobbing bombs at each other Rockets are going off, hoping that it's going to get the bad guy, but there's always collateral damage. If they kill uh, three innocent people and one is the bad guy, that's a pretty good number in modern warfare. That's awful to think about killing two or three people for every soldier that you want to kill. How do you fight a modern war without killing innocents? You absolutely cannot. You can't do it. It's just absolutely impossible. So from a Baha'i perspective, Abdu'l Baha as a modern prophet in the modern world ab abrogates holy war. There just is no justifiable war, except one exception. There's an institution. If there's a world organization and they have a, a compact between them <clears throat> and the borders of all the countries are set and there's an agreement, at that point in time, if one country invades another or violates that compact, then all the countries of the world should stop the invasion. But it's under a very specific delineated circumstance. Nobody can rationalize any current situation in the world 
saying that borders are established. Borders are in flux. That's why they're fighting in Ukraine. That's why they're fighting in Israel-Palestine, because we aren't agreeing on the borders. So, um, you know, th that exception is not something that takes place in the modern, you know, in the modern world. But I think that's another reason, despite the accolades and the desire for peace in all of our sacred texts, if we have that exception and then we make every, you know, so many situations fit that, we're fighting, you know, and setting aside those higher aspirations. So hopefully that makes sense to you and, and your listeners that we need to continue to read and promote and study those peaceful things and to really narrow down the concept of just war because in the modern world, it's really difficult. And just so people don't understand, I mean, I'm not saying that war is, uh, is never the thing that we need to do because there are Nazis, there are evils in the world that are just paramount. But I think we need to recognize it as an evil. War is evil, even the best war. There were a lot of German kids that were caught under houses, you know, in Germany when it was being bombed, you know, during World War II. Uh, the U.S. and Britain leveled whole cities. Dresden was absolutely leveled. There were thousands and tens of thousands of innocent kids that were caught in that. But the evil of Nazism was so bad. But even then, we shouldn't downplay that we're doing evil, that the bombs dropping on innocent kids' heads are evil. Maybe it's a necessary evil sometimes, but we should always do it with great hesitancy and respect for life and, and not just glorify and ignore the damage that modern war does in absolutely every circumstance. Can't be avoided now. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's a lot what you said, and there's so much to unpack and maybe we can do a part two. Um, so we can really get into that. Um, but you know, just to finish up, you know, how would we link then EQ to all of this? Like if you were to, you know, leave us with one final thought, how with optimizing one's emotional intelligence, how could they try to help like if we had a magic wand and if the person who's pulling the trigger had more emotional intelligence what would be you know what how would that help well we can create dream scenarios yes how Let's about do dr george <laughs> love doing medical healing qigong with uh the, the, with both sides together in the same room and let them laugh <laughs> together and know each other as people. Exactly. Humans, each other. To be, say that so, part again. Knowing the other, contacting each other and share and sharing our, our common humanity. Yeah. 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 Well said. And humor, humor is one of those tools that no matter how upset you are, humor can always bring those walls down. So I think laughing together, and definitely doing some peace ceremonies, uh, you know, whether that's using some, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a how do I say, a, a promoter of alcohol or, you know, entertainment of drugs or anything like that. But, you know, if you it, 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 do what you need to do to create some peace and some joy and some laughter and some lightness, right? Some bring some levity to, each other's lives and, and have those conversations from a human perspective, um, recognizing each other's level of crazy for sure. So Fun. Ted, this has Fun. definitely been, thank you so much for your time. This has been such a lovely conversation. It's a heavy conversation, but it's definitely one that's needed. Let's set up a part two at some point so we can really keep diving in, breaking those things down that you Would said. Be my pleasure. Yes, thank you. And um, and I'm going to finish with my quote. So if you know my quote, you're welcome to join me. If not, you can just listen and enjoy. So here we go, everybody. So when you know and understand yourself, the world will know and understand you too. And remember, what's the best that can happen? And now let's go get crazy.
<laughs> so all the best and we'll see you on the all next right. episode. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Take Ted. Care.